Amen, amen. Why don't you grab a seat? Are you glad you came to church today? Yeah, definitely. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up. We'll be in Genesis 32 in just a few minutes. Genesis chapter 32 as we continue our series, uh, Heroes of Faith. Um, my son Judah loves Legos. As a matter of fact, the way he says Legos, I personally love. Uh, it was a couple of years ago where he was talking about uh, Legos and he said it on the way home from school and he goes, Dad, I'm going to go home and build with some Legos. And <laughs> I just love that. And I, I'd pay the kid five bucks every time he'd say it. If he'd do it, he'd have a lot of money because I want him to say it all the time. But this kid is fiercely committed to building with Legos. And uh, he wants them for his birthday. He wants them for Christmas. He wants them every single chance that he can get, he wants Legos. This kid is committed. I'm telling you right now, uh, he'll stay there. Hey, Judah, it's time for lunch. Mm -mm. No, I'm building. Uh, and then hours later, not a peep. Don't hear a word sitting at the kitchen island. Uh, Joy's like, where's Judah? Uh, he's building. We know that. And uh, hey, Judah, it's dinner time, bud. It's time to eat. He's like, no, nah, I'm good, guys. I'm totally good. Uh, and then, you know, hey, now it's time for bed. And there's a little quasi meltdown a little bit because he's not finished yet uh, because he wants to continue to build. This is how committed this kid is. Look at this. Uh, this. I mean, this is what he does, guys. I mean, this is how he is. That was eight hours, guys. Like eight hours. Hours committed uh, to building this di how long? Oh, we did feed him, by the way. Yeah, Joy wanted to make sure everybody knew. We did actually feed him. Uh, but it was, you know, it was a protein bar. It was efficiency, right? Yeah. No. Uh, anyway, and so he's committed to this. And, uh, and he'll even wake up. I'm telling you, like 6 a.m., you can hear the dun, 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 dun down the stairs, right? And he's going down, and he's sitting at the island, and he is building. This kid is fiercely committed to it. And I love when he's done, because he's beaming with pride, and he puts it before you, and you're like, buddy, that is crazy. I can't, I don't know anybody who has that kind of commitment to stick with something that long. Dude, you're amazing. You're, you're the best little six-year-old I've ever seen. And I'm a little partial, but I mean, he's just great. It's just such commitment. And um, I remember this one day in particular uh, where I, you know, they, he likes to display them a lot of times in the kitchen cabinet because he knows that's where they're safe, like on the counter, so nobody can touch them because it's a big investment, right? Uh, but uh, sometimes they make his, their way up to uh, his dresser. So they sit on top of his dresser and our boys uh, share a room. And, uh, and so they're in the room one day, I remember this, and they're kind of horsing around. They're just doing what boys do, and they're wrestling. And my neck of the woods, where I'm from, they call it wrestling. Uh, that's what he was doing. I don't say that, but I have family who says that. Uh, and, uh, but they were wrestling, and boys were boys, and you hear maybe a slap, uh, a crack, and then you hear uh, a scream, and about five seconds later, Judah, with these big crocodile tears in his eyes, holding his once fully constructed dinosaur, or Lego thing and he hands it in front of you. I can't tell you how many times this has happened and he's crying and he's like Roman did it Roman did it and they wrecked and broke his Legos now if you have children uh, you know this what I'm about to tell you but if you have boys specifically boys you know that there is an axiom that stands the test of time uh, that is always faithful and always true it's almost as faithful and true as the word of God I mean listen when you wrestle something breaks can I get a witness come on I got a front row witness right here when you wrestle something breaks Man, I can't tell you how many times as a kid you, you wrestle, something breaks. Just one time in particular, uh, me and my best friend, we were in high school, and he had his younger brother, but we were all teenagers at this time, and I was the quarterback, Zach was the receiver, and Josh was the defender. And we played this game where they were on the trampoline jumping, and I was throwing them the ball. And listen, when you wrestle, something breaks. Well, two brothers, really, really close in age, when you wrestle, something breaks. Somebody got mad, somebody started pushing, somebody started fighting on the trampoline. Before we knew it, my buddy Zach, he broke his hand on his brother's face. And I'm telling you right now, when you wrestle, something breaks. Somebody gets hurt, and usually it's bad. Wouldn't you agree? We, can, can we agree together that it's usually bad? What if I were to tell you that when you wrestle, something breaks isn't always bad? That when you wrestle, something breaks isn't always negative. It's not always a bad thing. Here's the truth I want to lay before you today. God wants to wrestle you. And the goal of that match is to break you. 
God wants to break you. And he wants to break me. Now I know that's not super exciting, but here's what's the other side of this. Is that a broken you, jot this down, is the best you. A broken you and a broken me, that's the best place that we can be. And so what we find in Genesis 32 is a man named Jacob. And Jacob is a professional wrestler. Jacob has been wrestling since he was born. As a matter of fact, there was a prophecy over his mama's life with these two boys. And God said uh, that you have a war within your tomb. Now, some of you who are pregnant today, can I get a witness? You feel like a war is in your tomb, in your womb? And I get it. I totally get it. But here's the thing. There was an all-out war between Jacob and Esau, these twin boys, in their mama's womb. Matter of fact, when Esau was born, Jacob was reaching so desperately and so bad and wrestled so bad that Esau's out of the womb and there's a little hand just sneaking out grabbing his brother's heel. He'd been wrestling since he was a baby. He wrestled his brother's inheritance away from him. He wrestled this thing called The Blessing. It's a great book called The Blessing by Gary Smalley. You should take a look at it about speaking vision over your children's life. And that's what it was for Hebrews, was speaking vision and direction and calling out God's uh, best in your child. And he stole that from his brother Esau too. He'd been wrestling with his dad to get his approval. He wrestled with his future and father-in-law Laban. He's got two wives. That's a wrestle in and of itself. Let's not even go there. This guy's been wrestling. He's been scheming. His name Jacob means deceiver. He's been deceiving. He's been manipulating. He's been wrestling before he ever even got out of the womb. And this dude has got game. He's good. He is a masterful manipulator to get what he wants when he wants it. Now, as I started to think about him and us, I actually thought, if we're honest today... There's probably a little bit more Jacob in you and in me than we really would like to admit. There's this thing I read called the cycle of hustle. We're all in it. We're in this cycle of hustle where we've got to outwit, outwork, outsmart, outplay somebody else so that we can get what we want when we want it. And so there's this hustle thing in us. We got the Jacob hustle in you and in me. We all have it. And here's what I want you to know is God loves Jacob way too much and God loves you too much to leave you into that moment where you're striving and getting all the things that you think you need and manipulating to get ahead and outwitting and outsmarting and outdoing to get yourself to the top. God loves you too much to leave you in that spot and so he calls time out and he gets into the octagon and he MMA he boxes he's the heavyweight champion of the world I mean he is getting in your face and in my face and he begins to wrestle with you and in me because he wants to break that in you and in me because a broken you is the best you and so we pick up in this epic story in verse 22. Look at verse 22. The very first phrase, we gotta do a little bit of back work here, says the same night. What night? Everybody say what night? We can do a little Bible study. You okay with that? Hopefully you brought your Bible. If you don't, just grab your neighbors and put it in your lap and they can look on with you. <laughs> but uh, we don't want a wrestling match here with your neighbor. You can wrestle with God, just not with your neighbor right now. Uh, but uh, the same night, what night? Well, there, there, this is what had happened is Jacob remember he stole his brother's he wrestled his brother's birthright that's an inheritance and his brother's blessing he stole it from the older brother it was rightfully Esau's but it, it, Jacob took it and so he wrestled that and well, that really ticked Esau off so bad that he's like dude I'm gonna kill him I'm gonna kill him and so uh, Jacob and Esau Jacob's mom said get out of here and go stay with your uncle Laban and so he goes off for 20 years this guy's gone. He went over there by himself with a staff, left with two wives, 11 kids, two servants, and a ton of wealth. And so now he's saying, hey, at 20 years, I got to go back home, man. I, I got to go back home. I, we got to make this thing right. God was working through the circumstances of his life, and I got to make this right with my brother. We got to move forward, and God's called me to something else. He doesn't know that yet, by the way, but it is there. And so I got to get to the other side, and I got to go connect with my brother. Now, the issue is, is that his brother's not really having it. He didn't know how his brother's going to receive it, so he sends him, you know, all these cattle, all these donkey, all these camels, all these animals, and he's like, look, I stole the blessing, but here it is back. It's, I'm giving it back. I don't want... 
I don't want it anymore. Hopefully he'll, he'll be okay with this. And so he sends back the blessing and then he divides his family uh, into kind of two different groups and sends all of it in front of him so that if Esau comes at him, it's not a total loss because he gets word that it's not just Esau, your bro, coming back to give you a little high five handshake and a hug. He's coming back with 400 men. What would you do <laughs> if uh, you had an estranged relationship and your cousin comes back and is like, yeah, I brought the posse with me. I, I don't even know who says posse, but let's just go with it, okay? I brought a crew with me. That, that's not exciting. And so Jacob was actually fearful. The scripture tells us, Genesis 32, uh, verse 7, says that Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. That, that phrasing, it means he was locked up with fear. Like he was, it was this, he was having a visceral reaction to his circumstances. You ever been there? Where he was just wrenched over in utter fear for his life. So that's on that. He's like, man, we got to make this thing right. That's where I'm at. I'm afraid. I'm fearful. Esau's coming after me. And on that night, the scripture tells us, look what he does. I just explained most of it, but let's just make sure I'm not pulling things out of context here. He says, the same night he arose and took his two wives and two female servants and his 11 children. Uh, wow. And crossed the ford of Jabbok. Everybody say Jabbok. Jabbok. Say it again because it's just fun. Say it. Jabbok. Yeah, so it's it, it, Jabbok. Isn't it interesting that it sounds like the English word jab and he's about to fight? But what's even more interesting is what it means in Hebrew. It means to empty itself. It means to empty itself. Right now in this moment, he's standing at the ford. It's an entrance over the Jordan River, the ford of Jabbok. And for a Jabbok means to empty himself, empty itself. And here Jacob is. He's going to get to the season, to the moment, to the end of himself in his life. And God wants to get him to the most empty spot so that God could fill him back up. And God actually wants to take you to the Fort of Jabbok this morning to where you can get to the most empty spot today. And I know that sounds not hopeful, like, man, I'm really not glad I came this morning. You should be glad because it's only God who can fill you up. And if you came here empty, that's great news to know that God is an ever-flowing river of life for you through Jesus. And so he's standing at this and he sends his family over. Uh, just interesting fact, some people think that was about 30 feet. So this is not just some little, hey man, we're just gonna jump over the creek. This is not a creek, this is a flowing river here. He took, verse 23, them and sent them, his family, across the stream uh, and everything else that he had. It was right here in, in this moment where he was super vulnerable, uh, in a vulnerable position, locked up in fear uh, that God actually gets him right where he wants him. You know God's going to get you right where he needs you. All distractions gone. No little kids tugging at his toga. Nobody figured, hey dad, when, where, where are we going? No, no, no spouse saying, hey, hey, when are we going to get, what's your plan? I know you said we're going to this Jabbok thing and we're going to go over here and go back to your brother. I'd never met him, but he sounds like a psycho. Like when's this going to happen? Like, none, like nothing, he's by himself, he's alone. The scripture, very next verse, verse 24 says, and Jacob was left alone. Did you know that the greatest battles in your life are going to be fought when you're alone between you and God? There are several nights this week where God just wrestled with me. I mean, I had like just terrible sleep. I mean, it's not anything big, but God's trying to do something in me. You ever had those moments? Man, sometimes being alone, I actually would argue that the greatest times, specifically in the Old Testament, where God did something great in a leader, it was always before, uh, before he ever did something great, it was always when they were alone. So much of, like, we want to talk negatively about being alone, but man, there ain't nothing wrong with being alone between you and God. And God wants to do something in that moment with Jacob, so he gets him alone. And look at what the text says. This is, this is bonkers. It says, and a man, everybody say a man. And a man wrestled. Wrestled. If you're from Oklahoma, it's wrestled. Man wrestled, that's where I'm from, that's why I can say that, with him until the breaking of day. You know this must have freaked him out. You had to know. He was, there, listen, what's more scary? Afraid, alone, and dark. <laughs> By yourself. And then out of nowhere, some guy grabs you and puts you in a half Nelson chokehold. 
And you don't even know what's going to happen. You don't even know. Is it one of Jacob's or one of Esau's like little servants? Is it Esau himself? Did he sneak up on him? And here he was thinking he's going to get some sleep. You ever had one of those nights? I think I'm going to get some sleep and I'm just going to get some rest. My family's safe. My family's secure. We'll deal with Esau tomorrow. I know he's ticked. I know he's frustrated. And then out of nowhere, this man grabs him and he starts wrestling with him. And here's something crazy. Jacob immediately goes into beast mode. And he does what a wrestler always does. He just starts wrestling back. He just goes right back at him. He starts putting him in a chokehold. He starts going after this man. He starts putting him in a pen. He starts hoping he'll tap out. And just back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And the Bible tells us that he wrestled with this guy all night long. All night long. There's no timeouts. There's no breaks. There's none of that. Like he wrestled with this man all night long. Now here's what I found so fascinating. All week long, all week long, I I ran across so many people who are like, uh, you know, okay, first of all, let, let me start with this. Who picked this fight? So, I know we want to say that, man, like Jacob's just, just wrestling with God and he's, he's, he's wrestling with this and this is what's happening and, and man, uh, n- listen, this man picked this fight and this man was revealed in verses 29 and 30 that it is God. Now, he doesn't know that it's God, but it's God. Hosea chapter 12 tells us that he wrestled with the Lord. You want a $3 word? It's called theophany. It's the pre-incarnate Christ. He's wrestling with Jesus. Toe-to-toe with the Savior of the world. Who picked this fight? God picked this fight. God picked the fight. God started the fight. So all week long, I get all these commentaries together and all these people, that's what pastors do and they're doing their research and, and all these people are like, man, it, it, it preaches really well, y'all. It's like, man, you just got to get yourself in a position just like Jacob right at the forward of the Jabbok and you got to put yourself in a position to wrestle with God until you get that blessing. And you just got to stick with it until it happens. And I know it sounds good and it kind of is true kind of true, but really what that is is Christian motivational speaking. It's like Chinese food. I love Chinese food, but once it goes down about 30 minutes later, what do you need? I need a steak, man, because like all that stuff just ran right through and I'm done. It doesn't hold the test of time. It doesn't hold any water. And yes, you kind of got to put yourself in a position. You got to connect with God. Yes, that's why you're here today, but it's really not about you getting on God's team, but God coming after you. And so God initiates this wrestling match with this man, Jacob. Why? Because he saw something in Jacob that Jacob could never see in himself and it took a wrestling match to get it out of him. God put it there and so God's gonna drag it out of him. And the same is true for you. The same is true for me. There's this wrestling that you deal with, the wrestlings that I deal with, and what God's doing is God's trying to drag something in, pull something out of you and out of me. And here's Jacob this whole time. Well, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me, before I go there, James Montgomery Boyce once said that this is why this happens. Why God wrestles you and me. God comes to wrestle Jacob to bring him to a point of both physical and spiritual surrender. That's what he's doing. He wants him to physically surrender and spiritually surrender. God wants his everything. So he's going to wrestle him to the point where he absolutely, 100% desperately needs God. Up to this point, he really didn't think he needed God. Actually, he was all worried about his enemy, wasn't he? Where's Esau? What's is he, all this? His enemy was out there. I actually think we're a lot like that too, aren't we? 
For so many of us, our enemies are our circumstances. It's out there. It's, it's, it's my kids. They just don't get it. And they're the enemy right now. And I sometimes feel the exact same way that you feel. It's, it's my boss. He doesn't get it. She doesn't get it. It's my coach. It's my teacher. It's my circumstances. It's, you know, my spouse. It's all of these things. It's them. It's the, the, they're the enemy and the enemy is out there. But here's what I want to tell you today is that it was through the wrestling that Jacob actually got to the place where he finally realized that the enemy wasn't Esau. It actually wasn't even the guy he was wrestling. The enemy was Jacob. And can we just be honest today that for many of us, for most of us, the enemy isn't out there? For most of us, our enemy is really us. It's that thing, that selfish desire that you have, that you know, that I don't know about, but you know about. It's that routine sinful thing that every time it comes around, you just can't help yourself. You just run right towards it and you do it and you know you hate it, but it's that thing over and over and over and over and over and over again. It's these desires, it's these natures, it's all of this stuff. And the thing is, is that that's what God's running towards you in, in this moment, in the wrestling. He's coming right at that to get you to a spot, to get me to a spot of brokenness. He wants to break that. He wants to break that harmful desire. He wants to break that sinful nature. He wants to break that greed. He wants to break that ego. He wants to break that pride. He wants to do something in you. It was A.W. Tozer who once said that the Lord cannot fully bless a man until he has fully conquered a man. All of us want the blessing, but we don't want the wrestling. And if you want the blessing, you have to put yourself in a position of surrender to get conquered. Now that's counterintuitive. And I understand that. Because nobody's asking Kim Jong-un to conquer America. Nobody's asking Russia to conquer America. Right? Now, don't leave me up here by myself. Nobody's asking for that. Nobody's setting up a neighborhood train for, hey, let's conquer this street and hey, I want you to go ahead and take over. I want, no, that's not how that works. And, and we don't do that in sports. You don't yield to getting conquered. You don't yield politically. You don't yield in anything. But what's interesting is if you live that way, that's fine. But you're just living opposite of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is yielding. The kingdom of God is laying down. The kingdom of God is is surrender and so if we're all about just you know going after it and covering ground and taking ground we might not be living with a, what I would call a kingdom ethic really what God wants is to conquer you and to conquer me and it's scary and painful being conquered isn't necessarily exciting but what I want to tell you is that it's really actually freeing to be conquered. It's actually fulfilling. It's actually worth it. There's actually freedom in being conquered. So, Jacob in the wrestling, you know, I mean, he'd been wrestling his whole life, so he's probably pretty strong. Not like his brother Esau strong, but strong. Because he'd become accustomed to pushing back on God. Just like us. Just kicking back on God's plan for us. Kicking back on God's best for us. Like, like the longer you do that, the longer, I, the longer we do that, we just become pros at it. We just be, it's really like it's almost second nature. We just wake up and it's like, yeah, I know God, but I'm going to do this. Yeah, I know that's what you want, but I'm going to do this. And so we just get really good at it. Really good at it. And I want you to see what God does. Because Jacob thinks he's really strong and we think we're really strong, but maybe we're not as actually as strong as we think we are. Right here, God just starts flexing on him. Look at what he does in verse 25. And when the man saw that he did not prevail, now remember Jacob at this point doesn't know he's God, but we know it's God. So he says, when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, that sounds like God was losing. Does anybody just, let's interpret this verse by voting. How many of you would say that it sounds like God's losing? Raise your hand. 
It's, uh, listen, go ahead and raise your hand. Because I believe it. Thank you. I like that bold hand raise. Right here. God's not losing. What's happening here is the same thing that happens to you and to me. And I already said it. God noticed that a uh, Jacob was kicking back on the part of his heart that God wanted most. And says, no, 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 you're not going to, no, 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 you're not going to do that. I'm a little stronger than you. You can't have that spot. God's not interested in our half-hearted followership, by the way. He is really uh, resistant to my ultimatums on what I think he should do for me. You notice that about God? Not really interested in us giving him ultimatums and us dictating the rules on how this relationship goes. It's not like that. I know we're used to that as Americans, dictating the way the rules are played and the way the game's played, but that's not the way it works with God. And so it sounds like God is losing and he's not losing. He's just wrestling with that part of his heart that he needs to surrender, which is what the wrestling match is in your life and the exact same thing it is in my life. And here I think Jacob thought he was winning, just like I think I win sometimes and just like you think you win sometimes. And if you have a mamby-pamby little prissy view of God, then you'll beat God. But notice what God does. When, Jacob, or when he saw the man saw that he was not prevailing uh, or he was prevailing against Jacob, look at what he did. What is the next phrase? It says, he what? Touched. He did what now? Come on, like what did he do? Touched. All right, he touched. For some reason, I saw God as a Harry Potter just for a second, just a little touch like that, you know. <laughs> That's not God, by the way. Uh, but uh, he touched his hip socket and notice the description here. Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Still wrestling, now broken. Still wrestling, hip is destroyed. You see, I, I think what's happened up to this point is Jacob has had a really interesting perspective on who God is. If you look at verse 9 of chapter 32, it says that he prayed. That's a really loose word for what he actually did. It says he said, uh, but it's really he's saying a kind of prayer to kind of a God. He's like, it's the God of my father Abraham, the God of my father Isaac. It wasn't personal yet. He understood who God was. One writer says that he was re God to him was a benign figure. What does benign mean? Throw it out there. What does it mean? Huh? Harmless. harmless. Isn't that good? Harmless. He saw God as a harmless God. He saw God as maybe friendly. Yeah, like as, as a friend that he can manipulate to get what he wants. That's how he's viewed everybody else. I can just make God out to, to make him kind of uh, subject to my plans and to what I want him to do. And if you and I view God like that, then he's really, really small. Can I just ask you a question? How do you view God? How do you view him? I, I get a little afraid for my own life and for our lives as people that some of us, I think we view God a little soft, a little tender. Now, now hear me say this. He is the great healer. He is peace. He is forgiving and he is extremely loving. He is kind. He is a heavenly father, a good heavenly father, not at the expense of his might. It's both. God is extremely mighty. He is extremely strong to save. He is a victor champion of champions. He is a ruling king. His son Jesus will return on a white horse and the Bible tells us that he will destroy Satan literally with his heel. He will stomp him out. He won't break a sweat and that's how strong God is. He is strong, mighty to save and he is a victor and a wrestler. And what I want you to take away from this right now is that it's okay to have a little bit of reverential fear of God. It's okay to walk into his presence and to feel like you've got you, you to get low. It's okay to not walk in so cavalier. It, it's okay to sense his presence and to think, I, I better not say a word. It's okay to humble yourself at the feet of our great God. And let me just say, you better be glad you have a powerful God. It's the same God who touches his hip is the same God who spoke and everything was made.
It's the same God who told Moses to raise your hand, bro, and part the Red Sea. If you can get it in your mind, it's not like parting the Ohio, but in your mind, if you could just stand there at the shore on Ohio's side and look over at Newport and you were to just raise your hand and God goes, boom, and it's dry land and you walk across. That would be the picture in your mind. And that's the God that you serve and that's the God that's wrestling with Jacob and that's the God that's wrestling with me and it's okay to have a little bit of fear over his might and his power and it's literally he just touches a man and he crippled him. He just touched him. When God wants the war over, it's over. <laughs> you might think you're winning but God doesn't tap out. God doesn't tire. Done. Done. Jacob's done. And it's right here in this moment uh, that Jacob finally realizes just how powerful God is, just how big he was, how awesome God was, and that he cannot be used for his own means. And so here's Jacob, picture this, what started off is you picking a fight with me and he's coming right back at him and he's wrestling him with this pride, with this ego, with this man, uh, nobody's beating me, I always win. And he's coming at him and he's coming at him like an MMA fighter, he's coming at him like the heavyweight champion of the world and he's going after him and what started off with pride and ego, now he's hanging on for dear life with his leg just dangling there. And he was, I don't know what I'm going to do, but now I got to hold on to you because I, I can't move forward like this. The very next verse he says, <laughs> then God, he said, let me go for the day is broken. And Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Here, here's God. God, let me go. I got to go. Got to go back to heaven. I'm going back to heaven. And Jake's like, no, it's not happening. I'm not letting you go. I know, let me go. I'm not letting you go. Let me go. I'm not letting you go. I'm not going to do it. It's not going to happen. I'm not letting go. And this is what God wants for you. And this is what God wants for all of us in the wrestling is to cling to him with everything that you have. Cling to him with everything that you have. While you're hanging there, something is, interest, is unbelievably uh, revealing. Is he, there he is holding tight to the one who has broken him. Now he's at the point of physical surrender. And look at how this positions him uh, for spiritual surrender, for spiritual transformation. The next moment is insanely revealing. Here he is, remember, I'm not letting go, I'm not letting go. His leg's just dangling there. What started off with pride and ego now is in a space of humility. And he was physically surrendered, clinging to God with everything that he had. And look what happens next. And he said to him, verse 27, what's your name? What's your name, man? Jacob's holding on to him for dear life. Who is it that I'm holding to here? What's your name? In the Near Eastern culture, to ask some stranger their name was to say, Tell me your story. Who are you? What is your character? He's holding on and God says, what's your name, man? Who's holding on to me right now? And then he says, well, we don't get the pause, but I, I pro I'm pretty sure there was a pause there. Because he's got to own up to everything. I'm Jacob. Like I've been, I've been wrestling all my life. I've been deceiving and scheming to get ahead and manipulating. I've been doing, like dude, I'm a fraud. Like everybody thinks I'm this way uh, in front of everyone but when I go over here and I'm off over here in the shadows and nobody sees me right now, I'm a whole different person. There is this weird dichotomy in my life because when I'm out here, everybody knows me, everybody loves me but when I go over here, I'm a schemer and I'm living a double life. I am a fraud. I am a fake. I am a phony. And that's who I am because that's my character. I've always been that way. I've been that way since the womb. And it was right there that God got him to the right place. Bottom of the barrel. Totally broken. Totally vulnerable. It's right here in this moment. He struggled uh, for 90 seven years being this way. Y'all, that's, that's some actually some pretty good news. Because I don't know, I don't know where you're at in your life, but some of us, 
We've been dragging this puppy along for a long time. We've got this sin. It's got a name now. It's got a, it's got a location. It's got, a, it's got an appointment on our calendar. It's got an identity. We've, we're wrapped up in it. We're soaked up in it and, and nobody knows it and we've manipulated our way through it. We've, we've, we've downed it. We've drank it enough. We've snorted it enough. We've popped it enough. We've looked at it enough. We've been with them enough and now this thing, it's like family to us. And right there, Waiting in his sin, it was revealing. And it's in this wrestling, I guarantee you, Jake, he felt broken and he felt exposed. Broken and exposed. But that's when. The moment where we need to surrender everything, right there. I surrender the thing I've been ingesting. I surrender the thing that I've been looking at. I've surrendered the, the relationship that I know is opposite of what God's called me to because I'm married. I surrender what I've been a part of. I surrender those things. I surrender all of that. I, I let it go. And I know it's been something a part of who I've been for a very, very, very long time. The, spirit, the proverbial 97 years where I've been carrying it around for forever. It's that sinful desire, that thought process, what we've been doing. I'm telling you right now, many of us have been doing that for a long time. And you think there's so much freedom in that, but I'm telling you right now, as a person who's struggled as well, there's no freedom in that. It's bondage. And God loves you enough to meet you where you are, but not to let you stay that way. And he's going to wrestle it out of you. That's good news. I'm not saying it's easy, but in that moment of brokenness and weakness, look what happens right here, guys. This is unbelievable. He says, this is who I am. And God says, no, sir, not anymore. No, sir, that's not who you were. Yeah, your name was Jacob. Look at the verse. He says, and he said to him, my name's Jacob. And then he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob. Thank God. That is no longer who you are. You now have a brand new identity. Your name is now Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Every single time in the Bible somebody gets a new name, it means that's a brand new beginning. You just got a fresh start. Listen, you walked in here today as sinner, but you can leave a saint. You can walk a struggler, but you can walk away free and forgiven. I'm telling you right now that some of us today have literally wrapped our entire identity and character in the sins that we have been doing, whether public or in secret, and God is coming to you today through his word today with an MMA wrestling match coming at you with everything he has because he loves you too much to let you linger in that mess, and you might leave bruised, and you might leave a little bloody, but you'll leave better. You'll leave better. A new name, a new beginning. And all of this gets Jacob to the point where God really wanted him and he wants us. A broken you is the best you because it's God that you're fully surrendered to. A broken you is the best you because God finally got you to the place of full surrender to him. Every ounce of you. Every ounce of you. Full surrender, radical surrender. And when you surrender, guess what happens? Oh, Y'all, this is the best part. You get a new name. You get a new name. When you surrender everything to Christ, listen, I, listen I'm talking once and for all. I'm talking one time, you're surrendering for salvation. You're not in the family, then you're a part of the family. Ultimate surrender. But you know what? I think there's a lot of believers here today who know God. Know him. Read your Bible, read it. You're doing a version reading plan right now and you're knocking it out of the park. You're past two day 300. You, you're ahead. You're reading ahead of the curve. You're a part of every Bible study that this church has ever offered in the history of this church. You're writing Bible studies. 
showing up at all the right things, doing all the right things, saying all the right things. Listen, you can do all that stuff and your heart can still not be fully surrendered. There are moments in our lives, throughout our lives, where God says, yep, you're saved, but that part right there, nobody knows about, more surrendered. I remember years ago, talking to my father-in-law, who's, you know, retired now, been a pastor for a long time. And we were talking about struggle. And I remember him, I don't even know if he remembers this, but I remember him saying that Aaron, so much as I've matured in Christ and as you'll mature in Christ, hopefully the quick-temperedness, the external things that everybody sees, those things will begun, begin to become more submitted to Christ as you mature. You follow Christ for 50 years, you're not gonna fly off the handle like you did when you were 20. At least I hope you're not. And he said, but really it's those interesting little tiny spots in your heart that you thought were more surrendered than they really were. And so maybe it's really something nobody knows. They don't know how judgmental you are in your head, but you do. You, you don't understand what I'm saying? Like, I don't know what that is for you and I don't want to give it a name because I don't want to give you an out because I want you to think about it. But God wants that surrendered too. So you do get a new name and a new identity, but you also get a new walk. You get a new walk. That's what happened to Jacob. It says in verse 29, then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. There's a little, still a little bit of Jacob in Israel, y'all. <laughs> he still wanted to manipulate it just a little bit. Like it, how many of y'all know that even when God changes you, like there's still a little bit of residue left over from the previous life? Can I get a witness on that? A little bit of residue right there, okay? Still got a little Jacob in, is, in Israel. And here's the thing, still a little bit of you and you too. So what that means is it's just a journey, okay? Like you don't, it's never perfection until you see Jesus in heaven. So you're a work in progress just like me. I've heard it said before, it's okay not to be okay, but it's not okay to stay that way. Let's not diminish sanctification, and that's what this conversation is about. Let's not diminish slowly but surely becoming more and more like Christ. Let's not overemphasize, man, the struggle's real. I hate that, by the way. Man, the struggle's real. No joke, bro. Like, we all know that. But God's called you to be a light in a dark. God's called you to deeper surrender. God's called you to obedience. So we know the struggle's real. But obedience is equally real. That's what God wants for us. And notice this new, new walk. This is insane. So he says, what's your name? He didn't give him his name, but actually he kind of did. He said he blessed him. He got, it. he got his name. You met Grace that day, man, because you didn't deserve it, but you got it. So Jacob called the name of the place Penel, uh, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penel, limping, everybody say limping, limping because of his hip. Limping because of his hip. So when you wrestle, things break. Your ego breaks. Pride breaks. Greed breaks. Control breaks. Selfishness breaks. Lust breaks. Envy breaks. Anger breaks. And when you wrestle, things break. But there's beauty in the break. Because he was so afraid of Esau, y'all. Like he was so afraid. And here he is after the night of his life. The wrestling match that changed his entire future. And here he comes walking across the Jordan River. Here he is walking across there and he meets Esau. Check out the next chapter. Don't read on your own time. And he re comes over there and he's just limping across the way. And you got to imagine, he, bro, what is wrong with you? Like what happened in 20 years? Like we're the same age and I'm not limping. I'm great. You're, and you're limping. He goes, you don't even understand. You don't even understand. Because of the night I just had. What do you mean the night you just had? I literally saw God. And I thought I had him down. I thought I had him pinned to the mat. But God didn't tap out. He actually tapped my hip. And he set me out. And I was coming at him with pride. And I was, now I'm clinging on to him for dear life. And he changed my name. Don't even call me Jake anymore. Call me Israel. 
And I'm walking around with this limp. And I don't know about y'all, but I just had this feeling. If you go look at it, it says that he bowed, he bowed, and he bowed. Even at his kids bow. He had his wife bow. What was once prideful and arrogant now is in utter humility. One verse says, I just hope you accept this. I hope you just accept the grace that God has given to me. And now I give it to you. And what's fascinating is you get to the very end of chapter uh, 33. And the scripture says in verse 20, there he erected an altar. And you know what he called this altar? Listen to this. This is insane. He called this altar God, the God of Israel. Hold on now. Israel's not a location anymore. Who's Israel? Israel's Jacob. Now this God who was the God of my father, Abraham, the God of my father, Isaac, was now no longer the God of my fathers, but now he's the God of Israel. He's now my God. I've wrestled with God, and God has saved me. God has changed me. God set me free. And yeah, I got a little bit of a limp, and I'm going to have it the rest of my life. But listen, when you encounter God, you get a new identity, and you get a whole new walk. And so he would rather limp with God through his life rather than run without God. And so what I'm hoping for today for you. And what I'm hoping for today for me is that we don't leave here pre-wrestle match. My hope is that we leave here today with a little bit of limp. I would like to call that the literal spiritual swagger. Some of y'all got to have a little bit of limp. I remember watching Rev Run years ago on one of his shows and he said, Kato Mate. He's just kind of pushing that out of the way like Kato Mate, just a little limp like this. You got a little limp, a little swagger to you. What that is, is it's not literally your swagger. It is Kato Mate. It is God's swagger. It's because God has wrecked you. God has broken you. God has brought you to the bottom, to the emptying of yourself and has filled you up and you no longer have confidence in you. You no longer love that which you used to do when nobody knew it. You now love God more and he has filled you up more of with him than you could ever be filled up with your own stuff. And so you might have a little limp too and you might have a little scar this morning too. You might have a little bruise too but that's okay. Those are literally battle wounds that you've encountered God and you ought to leave this place different. Every time you open this book you ought to leave different. You ought to have a little bit of a limp. You ought to have a little bit of a fat lip for where God has corrected you and corrected me so that now we are more fully surrendered and more fully dependent upon him. And he loves you enough to wrestle with you because he knows that a broken you is the best you because he wants to get you to fully surrendered. The question is, is are you going to tap out too early? Or are you going to go all in and just let God have his way? Years ago, I heard a preacher say of an encounter he had in Alabama with this church and he preached this sermon and said God wants to ruin your life and this guy comes up to him afterwards and he says Mr. Nasser, what do you mean God wants to ruin your life God wants to empty you is what he's saying empty me of me so that he can have space to pour all of him so that you would be fully surrendered and might I just say that the broken you is the better you, but can I just add this? Check this out. The broken you truly is the blessed you. It really is. The question is, is are you just gonna submit to it? I've been wrestling. You've been wrestling. We wrestle. Let God have his way.